Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bible study here at Calvary Baptist Church in Dover, Delaware, historic Calvary Baptist Church. And so we thank you for this opportunity that you have taken to share with us uh, for this time of study in the Word of God. Again, as I always tell you, this is such, this is such a good time for us to be together uh, to study the Word of God, especially as we uh, continue to live through uh, this pandemic and all of the things that are going on just in the lives of people. It's good to be able to go to the Word of God, study the Word of God, and know that the Word of God um, will do what it says it will do. And even as we study it, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm always encouraged, always encouraged by the reading of the Word of God. Uh, hopefully, uh, you've gotten my missive this week. Uh, I wanted to certainly be of an encouragement to you. Uh, as we continue to move forward through uh, all that is happening. Uh, again, uh, we're still sort of in scale-back mode, if you will, uh, here at CBC. We're only asking those persons who have been vaccinated to uh, be with us in in-person worship, and we're asking everybody else to worship with us virtually. Uh, and so thank you. You've been, you've been so good and so kind about, uh, about doing that. And I can tell this happening because... Um, uh, our online numbers are just going through the roof right now. So um, that lets me know that uh, even though you're not present with us in the sanctuary, uh, that you are still tuned in and that you're still connected. And that means a whole lot to us because in this season of isolation and separation, it's just good for us to make sure that we're staying connected. Um, those of you who are part of the CBC family, uh, we, are, we are yet family even though we are scattered. Uh, we're still family. We're still taking care of each other. Uh, we're still, our deacons are still checking on people. And we're just trying to make sure that we stay connected even in this place of, that has us separated right now. And we so look forward to that day uh, when we can get back into the sanctuary. Don't know how soon it's going to be, um, but whenever it's going to be, we're going to be ready for it. So uh, we certainly uh, miss your face. Uh, we miss your energy. We miss hearing your amens live. Uh, we miss your praise live. Uh, I'm getting, I get text messages, emails all during the week. Uh, people just shouting and praising God uh, in their houses, in their living rooms. And that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Uh, because I believe that wherever the people of God are, God is there too. So even if you're not able to physically be with us in in-person worship, uh, we know that the same God that is in the same anointing that's in this room uh, is in your living room, in your bedroom, is in your house, or wherever you enjoy uh, the services of CBC. So we're grateful for that, grateful for that. So as usual, we ask you to do several things. Uh, I know it's a little redundant, uh, but uh, I just want to make sure that uh, you remember to do it. First thing, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Uh, this is how we're able to reach so many people. And thank you, thank you, thank you to the members of CBC who are creating all of these little watch parties and things that are going on. You got, you got your friends and your family all over the country, all, all around the world watching what's happening uh, in our worship services and our Bible study at CBC. That's a blessing. I always tell people, you can't expect other people to be excited about something you're not excited about. And so because you're excited about uh, your being a part of the CBC family, you want others uh, to enjoy that experience as well. And so thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for liking um, our services on all of our social media platforms. Uh, and please make sure that you're subscribing so that you'll know that whenever we have live content going across the airways. Don't forget, we have content for children as well. Please don't forget that. So just make sure that you know that while you're enjoying uh, worship services on Sunday or Bible study on Wednesday, there is content on our YouTube page. There's content on our CBC YouTube page for your children. It's interactive. It's fun. I've been on there myself, enjoying some of it myself. So uh, there is a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a place for them to be while you're studying uh, the Word of God with us on this level. There's a place for them virtually for them to study the Word of God on their level. And trust me, they'll enjoy it. It's real interactive. It's real fun. Uh, it's not boring. Take my word for it. It's not boring because I don't like boring. So it's not boring. 
but it's, it's good. So make sure your children are taking advantage of that. Our team has gone through some, they've gone through countless hours and, and effort uh, to make sure that uh, our children uh, have access to the Word of God as well. Uh, and so we're grateful for that. So please make sure you check it out. It's right there on our YouTube page. You can go check it out. You can hook your children up right now while I'm going through my introduction. And they can be doing their thing. You can be doing your thing. So make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Second thing I want you to do is just make sure uh, that we are praying uh, for all of our sick and shut in. People are going through so much. Uh, we're, people are experiences, experiencing loss uh, at levels that we just have not seen before. And so please make sure that you're praying for people. Their names are on the screen. Uh, take a picture of it. Make sure you call their name when you get ready to uh, say your prayers. Uh, when you have your time with God, please make sure that you call those names out. We have several people who are going in through bereavement right now. And so we want to pray for them. Uh, Sister Collins, Sister Newman, uh, Trustee Willie Sanders and Veronica Sanders, she lost her mother. Uh, Sister Florence Kilby, who lost a cousin, an uncle, and an aunt. Uh, and so, so many things are happening. So many things are happening. And we want to make sure that we are taking care of each other while we're going through our time of bereavement. Then the last thing I'm going to ask you to do is if you have questions as we go through the lesson, please make sure you put them in the chat. Put them in the chat. Uh, and we will come together at the end. We had such a good time last week that we forgot what time it was, but um, uh, we want to make sure that you uh, put all your questions in the chat, and we will um, address those as best we can. We'll get, if we, what we can't get to, we'll, we'll get to it to follow up. Also, don't forget, if you have ideas for Bible study topics, please make sure that you shoot those to us as well. Uh, you, can, you can drop those in the chat, or you can send them to info, at calvaryforward.org, and we'll get those and pray over them and give consideration to that. All right? Okay, so let's just jump to the lesson uh, tonight. Uh, tonight is going to be just a little dense, so I want you to prepare for that. So you might want to get you some coffee or some Mountain Dew or something with some caffeine in it uh, so you don't drift off. Uh, but I, uh, it's going to be just a little slightly dense because I want to give you some historical context uh, to some of the conversations that we're having as it relates to, uh, as it relates to knowing God. So uh, just hang on with us because it's, it's a back and forth. It's a back and forth. I was talking to uh, Elder Guy before we uh, came on tonight, and I was letting him know that this Bible study series is just kind of taking a life of its own. Uh, every time I think we're getting ready to go to the left, we end up going to the right. So it's just kind of taking a life of its own. So uh, we just, wherever the Spirit of God leads us, we're going to follow. That's the direction that we're going. That's a wonderful blessing. Learn how to be fluid. I think one of the words that we were using in 2021, I think we're going to keep using in 2022, is learning how to pivot. You got to learn how to pivot. You got to learn how to change. You got to learn how to, you got to learn how to be in the moment. And sometimes the moment requires a different thing. And you can't be so stuck in your ways that you can't shift when you need to shift. But that's a whole other Bible study and sermon by itself. So, Let's jump in and have a little conversation tonight. Don't forget that we have two goals in mind, two goals in mind as we deal with this Bible study on knowing God. Uh, if there was a subtopic to it, it would be the God you imagine versus the God that is. The God that you imagine versus the God that is. But in this Knowing God series, there are two goals that we have. One is deliverance from our own thoughts. Not to say that your thoughts are not good when it comes to God, but don't box God in by your thoughts. Don't think that that's the only way God can show up, God can manifest, God can move, God can work. Uh, and so we want, we want a little deliverance from, from our own thoughts. The second thing we want to do is we want to be uh, more intentional. We want to be intentionally open to who God is beyond our thoughts, beyond our thoughts, who he is beyond our thoughts. And I think we briefly visited um, Job last week, and, and we're going to jump into Job just a little bit, just a little bit uh, tonight. Uh, we also referenced Jesus's conversation with the woman at the well in John chapter four. We're going to deal with that a little bit tonight. 
That, that's the benefit of Bible study. We get to do more than one thing at a time. We get, to, uh, we get to delve into more than one thing at a time and then bring it all together. So that's the beauty of uh, Bible study. If you're a preacher, don't try that in a sermon. But if you're doing it in Bible study, it works a whole lot better, okay? So I want to remind you of our look into John chapter 4. Uh, and I want to give you a little bit of historical context to uh, John chapter 4. So uh, uh, you might not do a lot of shouting tonight, so it'd be good. Go on and get your pen and paper or however you take your notes. Uh, get comfortable, and we'll run through this a little bit. So well, John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, I want to look at that just for a minute because we get to see Jesus, and we mentioned it a little bit last week. We get to see Jesus interact in a space that would traditionally not be a space for a Jewish man to interact, especially with a Samaritan woman. And one of the things that I like to do with people is sometimes we see things happen in Scripture um, and we don't ask the right questions. Sometimes things happen in Scripture and we just kind of glaze over them, if you will, and move on to the next thing. I, I don't read the Bible like that because when I'm when I'm reading the text and it tells me something that's out of the norm or out of the tradition, for me, I kind of want to know why. I kind of want to know what's going on. What's, what's the reason for that? Why, is, why, why can't that be or why shouldn't that be? And so when I read this passage of uh, this woman at the well, this, this woman, this Samaritan woman, and, they, and, and all the commentaries say that Jesus interacts in this space that would traditionally not be a space for a Jewish man to interact. I don't glaze over that. I want to know, know why. I want to know what's going on. And so the, let me give you a little historical context to that because uh, when Judah and Israel, you, you're, you're often hear it referred to as Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom. It's the, the split that takes place. That, that's a whole nother historical context to talk about right there. Uh, but Judah and Israel split in, around the ninth century. They split around the ninth century. A king by the name of Omri of the northern kingdom, he buys this hill in Samaria from Shamir. You'll find that kind of in 1 Kings chapter 16. So again, uh, this is kind of historical context, some, so this won't be on the slide, so you may want to take notes with this. Um, he buys this hill in Samaria uh, from Shamir in 1 Kings chapter 16. He builds the city of Samaria on this hill, which becomes his capital, which becomes the place from which he governs. Well, it falls to the Assyrians around 722 BC. And some of the Samaritans are led off into captivity. But the Jews that are permitted to stay behind begin to intermarry with the Syrians. Uh, you know, you, you hang around folk, that's all you see, that's all you, you know, you, you develop a desire for what you see. And um, so they begin to intermarry. There were also some introductions to idolatry. Uh, so, so not only were they dating one another, if you will, uh, and I know that's not first century language, but it helps us to understand context. Um, but when you start liking somebody, you start liking some of the same things they like. Yeah, so, so you start seeing some introductions to idolatry. You, you, you know how it is uh, and when you're dating somebody, you know, y'all compromise a little. You do a little bit of what he want to do. You do a little bit of what she want to do. Well, in first century, that, that's dangerous, especially if you are dating outside, if you will, outside of that particular uh, tradition, that particular faith tradition. And so there's, there's some introductions to idolatry that start to happen. So when Sirius, and if you remember the sermon from Sunday, uh, when Sirius permitted the Jews to go back from Babylon, come out of exile, and go back to Jerusalem, the Samaritans are ready to welcome them back. So Sirius permits the Jews to, to return from Babylonian exile, 
Uh, and when they get there, the Samaritans are saying, yes, let's, let's work. Let's get this thing done. Let's, let's get this wall built. Let's get this temple built. Well, when the Samaritans wanted to join in the rebuilding of the temple, if you remember from the Sermon Sunday, uh, Ezra was responsible for building the temple. Nehemiah is responsible for building the wall. And so when they get back and they're ready to start this whole rebuilding process, the Jews who come back to Jerusalem out of Babylonian captivity uh, tell the Samaritans who have who are Jews who have intermarried with the Syrians, they tell them, now, thank you for your help, but no thank you. We, we prefer uh, not. So they reject their help. And so with that rejection, uh, there is this hostility that is built up uh, between these people. And there, there is this opposition, this hostility and opposition. And so the Samaritans decide that since y'all won't let us help you, We'll just slow down the whole building process. And in Nehemiah chapter 13, in Nehemiah chapter 13, uh, we kind of get a little historical context because we're told that the grandson of the high priest, Eliashib, married the daughter of Samballot. Come on, y'all, y'all got to stay with me here. Remember, Samballot is one of the people uh, whose jeering I think that's the word of scripture, who's mocking and juring the Jews as they're building the wall. And, and you know, you get that famous statement from Nehemiah when he says, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. In other words, uh, my translation, I ain't got time for your foolishness. So he, he stays up there and, and let them do what they do, and he's doing what he's doing. Well, the high priest, Eliashib, marries the daughter of Samballot, who is the governor of the province of Samaria, which is where your Samaritans are. And so to make matters work, worse, the historian Josephus tells us that Samballot ends up having a temple built on Mount Gerizim so that his son-in-law, Eliashib, could function since he was rejected by the Jews. It, it was, okay, yeah. Let me see it like this. You know, it's like it's like being a part of, uh, and this is this is no reference to no particular church, okay? But it's like being a part of uh, First Baptist Church, and then um, you want to do something at First Baptist Church, and they tell you you can't do it, and so you get mad, and so you go start Greater First Baptist Church. Y- y'all know how we do. Y'all, y'all know how we do. Yeah, so the so same thing happens here. So when the Jews reject, when they reject the Samaritans' help, Samballot then go builds his son-in-law, Eliashib, a temple so he can function in. So since, since my son-in-law can't preach at y'all church, I'll go buy him one. That, that's how that happened. And, 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 and so... He couldn't function since he had been rejected by the Jews, primarily, primarily because he marries a non-Jewish woman. And so that's when this full break between the Jews and the Samaritans take place. And so that hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans is what makes this interaction with Jesus and the Samaritan woman so powerful. Y- y'all follow what I'm saying? Because they, they, they not only don't like each other, they can't stand each other. Okay? I mean, they, and so when Jesus has this conversation with this woman, this Samaritan woman, that's what makes the moment so powerful. Because you got two people talking that's not even supposed to be talking, not only because it's a man and a woman, but because they hate each other. And so for the sake of the series, it demonstrates to us, though, watch this, y'all, that just because, and I want y'all to catch this. I, I really want somebody to tweet this, write it down, put it on a refrigerator, do whatever you do. But just because we have problems with people doesn't mean God has a problem with them. 
Oh, Lord Jesus. You know, we fall out with people, and because we fall out with them, we think God fall out with them, too. And for some reason, we believe that the people we can't get along with, God don't want nothing to do with. And that's because we believe, watch this, that our thoughts and our beliefs are somehow theologically accurate. We, we think that because we think it, God thinks it. We, we, we think because we pray against people that God is paying attention to their foolishness. I ain't got nobody to help me here. Watch. So watch, watch what happens. Watch what happens. Let me make a few comments, and then we're going to move on a little deeper. Um, CBCS, uh, I think uh, Elder Owens put a plug in for Calvary Bible College and Seminary. Let me put a plug in. Um, I taught a class a couple of months ago um, on the theology of a man named James Cone. Uh, for those of you who are not scared to read social justice stuff, uh, read his stuff. It, it, it'll bless you. Um, James Cone makes a, a few statements. I know some of y'all may not like him, and then there's some evangelicals who are probably watching who are saying that social justice is antithetical to Scripture. You can go on and miss me with that foolishness. But James Cone makes a statement uh, that's kind of worth our consideration as Christians. There's a book he writes. Uh, it's called The God of the Oppressed. The God of the Oppressed. And in the book, watch what he says. And the quote is on the screen for you. He says, it is impossible, watch this, to, re to interpret the scripture correctly and thus understand Jesus aright unless the interpretation is done in the light of the consciousness of the oppressed in their struggle for liberation. Lord Jesus, that's, that, that's a whole lot. I, I hope you caught that. But he says, you can't interpret scripture correctly and understand Jesus right, watch this, unless your interpretation is done in light of the consciousness of the oppressed. In other words, you can't read the Bible and you can't know Jesus without taking into consideration marginalized people. In, 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 in other words, if, 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 if your Christianity does not allow you to reach out and touch people who are less than you, then there's something wrong with your Christianity. Any Christian, Lord Jesus, thank you, any Christianity that doesn't allow you to get your hands dirty helping people is not the Christianity that Jesus would be proposing or pushing. It's not even scriptural. It, it's like that whole thing about the, the Samaritan on the side of the road. Come on, y'all. And, and the people who ought to be stopping are the people who just walking on by because they don't want to get involved. They don't. Oh, Lord. So, 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 so if, if, if our Christianity uh, does not make us feel some kind of way about people who are still living on the margins of life, then some, somewhere along the line, we've lost our way. We, we, we've lost our way. We, we've lost our way. So here's what James Cone says. James Cone says that any view of the gospel that fails to understand the church as that community whose work and consciousness are defined by the community of the oppressed is not Christian. Now, he goes a little step further and says it's heretical. But it, at, at, at minimum, it's not Christian. Any view of the gospel that fails to understand the church as that community whose work and consciousness are defined by the community of the oppressed. In other words, uh, 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 what, what makes us who we are are the people who need the Jesus that we know. Oh, I wish I had some help right there. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if, if, if your Jesus is only good for you, then you, gotta, you need to upgrade your Jesus. Because your Jesus is supposed to make you reach out to people. Come on, y'all. It, it's supposed to. You, you should feel some kind of way. 
You should feel some kind of way. You know, uh, 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 when, when people who don't look like you, dress like you, uh, smell like you, come on, y'all, uh, and then they come to our churches and they're relegated to some, some section off somewhere where, where oh, y'all not hearing what I'm saying? Something's wrong with that. Because those are the people who need Jesus. Y'all ain't saying that. Those are the people who need to come in contact with people who say they love God. God got his hands dirty helping us. Oh, y'all not going to talk right there because he didn't get all of us from church. And he's still getting his hands dirty with some of the saints. Please don't make me go there because even some of the saints ain't acting right. I mean, even, even, some, of, see, even some of the saints are drinking and, and, and partying and, and cohabitating. Y'all ain't, y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Uh, and, 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 and committing adultery. Y'all ain't saying nothing right here. And fornicating. So even, even God is still getting his hands dirty with the saints. Not, not pre-Jesus, I'm talking post-Jesus. Come on, we're getting, out of, we're getting out of bed with folk we ain't married to and coming direct in choirs. Y'all, y'all ain't gone. Y'all, y'all ain't, you, 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 you know, you, 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 didn't, you, didn't, you didn't got drunk all night and now you didn't popped a few mints and now you won't come and lead praise and worship. So, so, so even God is still getting his hands dirty with the saints, the saints. Let me, let me give you one final quote here. Let me give you one final quote. Here it is. Um, the principle for an exegesis of the scripture is the revelation of God in Christ as the liberator of the oppressed from social oppression and to political struggle, wherein the poor recognize that their fight against poverty and injustice is not only consistent with the gospel, but it is the gospel. How is that so? Jesus said himself, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Y'all, come on, I need y'all read the Bible. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Come on to bring freedom to the captive. Y'all need to read the Bible. That is the gospel. So, so if our gospel is not at least recognizing uh, the fight of the marginalized people against poverty and injustice, then it is not consistent with the gospel, especially the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might be preaching a gospel, but you're not preaching the gospel. So, so James Cone is, of course, I know, I know my critics are going to say, but Bishop, James Cone is referring to social justice more so than spiritual liberation. I contend that those two things are not mutually exclusive. I don't think you can talk about one without talking about the other. Because I think we got we to gotta understand uh, uh, when people get through shouting, they still got to live. Y'all, y'all, come on now, come on. And so, and so it, is, it is just as important, you know, I know we come to church, we praise, we worship, we dance, we do all of that kind of stuff, but you don't know that when you're going home to your nice warm house with all your refrigerator full of food, somebody is going somewhere, hoping to get a meal somewhere. When you drove to church, somebody walked. Come on, y'all. In 20 degrees weather, somebody walked, which hence kind of plays into my whole concept of that's why I don't think church should ever be closed or canceled, but that's a whole other story. But here what I'm trying, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm trying to say to you. I'm trying to say to you that if your Christianity does not, does not reach people who are, who other people consider unreachable and does not love people who other people consider are unlovable, then there's something wrong with that Christianity. And so when you say to me, James Cone talking about social justice, not spiritual liberation, 
I, I, I'm kind of disagreeing, but, but I, raise, I raise those comments because I believe that our relationship with God, come on, does not just have eternal implications, but it has life implications. That's why James says, uh, 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 when you see a brother in need and, 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 and you got four loaves of bread under your arm and you know he's hungry and you just say, God bless you and keep walking, he says something wrong with that. Because the blessing he needs might be the blessing he's talking to right then. You might be the blessing. You don't need four loaves of bread, no way. Watch what's happening. Watch. Watch. That's, that, that, that's why I, 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 don't believe you, you, I don't believe you can preach the gospel. And as James Cone would say, James Cone says, you can't, you can't be a Christian and be a racist. Because the two don't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, y'all. He says it, it, it don't work. Evangelicals, it don't work. You, 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 you cannot not stand in your pulpit and talk about the fact, come on, y'all, that, that we got problems in this country. You're just going to act like they don't exist. You, you're just going to act like we ought not be talking about voting and voters' rights. See, it? that's when folk get quiet right there. That was, you understand know what I'm saying? So, 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 there's something suspect about separating the spiritual and the social. And by the way, when they did it, that's how they created slavery. But there's enough of that right now, okay? So, what does this have to do with our series? I know you're asking. God is so much bigger than our finite thinking. And to box him in without considering the fact that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways is to trifle with the integrity of who God is. To try to only make God be one way and not be open to the fact that God is not stapled to our thoughts and he's not stapled to our ways is to trifle it, 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 it is to trifle with the integrity of who God is. God is bigger than my thoughts, your thoughts, all of our thoughts. So now, think about this with me. Job, Job, let, let me go back and, and, and clean, up, clean up on aisle six with Job. Here it is. Job discovers that God is more interested in the, watch this, write this down, y'all. God is more interested in the authenticity of our character than he is in our rituals. Come on. God is more interested in the authenticity of our character than he is in our rituals. And if we understood that, we would stop going to the communion table on first Sunday as raggedy as we go. Because God is more interested in the authenticity. He's, in, he's more interested in you coming right than he is you getting the ritual right. Because some people, are, some people are more concerned about getting the word right, the words of the ritual right, than they are living right. And so, and so, our rituals have little power when our character is at least, at the least, questionable. Job discovered that as religious as he was, he had developed a particular pride that started to mess with his practices. And what God did, God through suffering taught him, at best we are sinners. And watch this, y'all, we have no right to expect anything from God but judgment. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. See, I already know. Okay, y'all going to make me make this page longer than it need to be. Watch. Watch what happens. God through suffering teaches Job, at best we're sinners, and we have no right to expect anything from God but judgment. See, that's why we got to be careful to watch our language. We got we got, we got to be careful to watch our language because there are, some, there are some people who believe that because I do a thing, I, I have a right to expect a thing. 
Come on, y'all. Come on. We, we, that's what we think. We, we think, we, we, we think, and we got people thinking stuff like, you know, uh, if, you, if you do this, this is going to happen. And then, and then the, the, the problem is it's not wrong, but it, 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 it becomes contaminated when you think you have a right to expect. Y'all missing me? Y'all missing me? So, so somebody tells you, uh, uh, dance for your blessing. Okay, that's good. That's good. You, you should. You, you can do that. Praises go up, blessings come down. But you don't have a right to expect it. Mm. Y'all ain't here. The only thing we have a right to expect is judgment. Because, okay, because at best, at best, in all of our righteousness, the Bible says that we're still as filthy rags. If it wasn't for the blood, come on, if it wasn't for the blood, we'd all be lost. I don't care how, I don't care how good of a person you are. Without Jesus, you can't go to heaven. Oh, that, 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 now there's my, that, that's my, that's my, that's my fundamental Christianity coming out right there. You can't go to heaven without Jesus. You can't send a prayer to God without Jesus. That's why we tag it on the end, in the neck, because God has, mm, God doesn't have to accept anything from us, but guess what? He honors his son. I'm telling you, he honors his son. And so when I say we don't have a right, we don't have a right. We don't have a right. You okay? I, I pay my tithes. I expect to be blessed. You don't, you, you, you don't have a right to expect that. You don't have a right to expect that. The only reason you, the only reason God does that is because He makes you a promise based on grace. Because you don't want God to be fair. Oh, y'all don't. Y'all ain't hearing nothing I'm saying here. You, you, you don't want God to give you what you deserve. So while we run around talking and being entitled, talking about what we expect and what we have a right to, you might want to rethink that. Because we don't have a right to expect any. God don't have to bless us. Don't believe me? Go read Romans chapter 9. The creation can't tell the creator what to do. So we, we don't have a right to expect anything from God but judgment. But because of the faithfulness and the mercy of God, we get to live in a space of grace, not in a space of entitlement. And Job becomes this acute example, if you will, of that embedded theology versus that deliberative theology that we talked about last time. Let me get through. Let me get through this, this next one here. So let's, let's take a deeper dive tonight. Let's take a little bit of a deeper dive. The truth is, and I'm, let me put this out here. The truth is, we may not know God as well as we think we do. Mm. Because Psalm 145 says his greatness is unsearchable. Romans chapter 11 says his judgments are unsearchable. Ephesians chapter 3 says his riches are unsearchable. So even when we say God, you know, we sing the song God is great. We sing in God is great. But our greatness is kind of relegated to our finite thinking. But guess what? He greater than, he's greater than we think he is. Come on, y'all. Uh, his judgments are unsearchable. See, folk don't believe God to get them. Oh, see, there it is right there. Because we, we only want to talk about the love of God. And that's okay. That's okay. We won't talk about the love of God, but keep playing with God and see what happens. So his judgments are unsearchable and his riches are unsearchable, which watch this, y'all. You can't have a need that God can't feel. 
I don't know who I just said something to right there. You, you, can't, you can't have a need that's so great that God does not already have enough of a supply to meet it. But that doesn't mean just because his greatness is unsearchable, his judgments are unsearchable, his riches are unsearchable, that doesn't mean that he cannot be known. So this series proposes that God, who is unsearchable, can be known. Let me give you one of my, one of my favorite persons um, to read devotionally, a man by the name of A.W. Tozer. Here's what Tozer said. Tozer says, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Tozer says, how you see God, how you think about God is the most important thing about you. He says we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. In other words, we cater to the God in our head, not the God that is. Oh, oh. See, see our, our personalities will inevitably conform to our, conform to our goals. Our gods. Yeah. I'm going to say it again. Our personalities will inevitably conform to our, go to our gods. When, 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 when our God is more in line with the God of Scripture rather than the God that we created in our head, it takes away a lot of stress and leads us to study him, know him, love him, reflect him in our attitude, in our actions, and our personalities. God doesn't want us to do what we do for him because we're afraid of him. He wants us to do what we do for him because we love him. Oh, Lord, have mercy. God don't want you showing up for a rehearsal because you're afraid if you don't show up, you're going to get struck by lightning. I ain't got nobody, I ain't got nobody here. God wants you to show up because you love him more than you love convenience. Okay, so last time we, we talked about what it means to know God. We talked about that. Knowing God implies we are growing in knowledge. If you remember, um, and you may not know this historically, but when, 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 when Peter was about to be killed, when he was about to be executed, he wrote 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. And this is what he wrote. This is on his way to his death. This is what Peter wrote on his way to his death. He said, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forevermore. That don't sound like language of somebody that's getting ready to die. But when you know God, you love him more than your situation. You love him more than what you're going through. Y'all, if, if you read through Peter's epistle, you, you'll note something that he uses this word knowledge seven times in three chapters. In fact, he opens up 2 Peter with those words, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. And then he writes in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, he writes, uh, 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 his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us. Watch this. It, uh, knowing God affects everything else we know and everything we do. And so that's why I was trying to tell you the last week, it's got to be outside of some intellectual pursuit, but it's got to be out of our authentic love for God. Let me make this point, and then we're going to have a little conversation. In, in the first letter, in Peter's first letter, Peter helps us with this pursuit of knowing God. But his angle is a little different in that Peter is not only, he not only suggests the more you know, the more you grow, but I want to get to this point. Peter says growth also happens through experience. So it's not just head knowledge, it's life experience. Okay, how do we do this? 
Peter dictates his letter to encourage persecuted, displaced followers of Christ who he knows have been going through, but they're continuing to endure. And so by the time you get to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, can I read that to you? And then we're going to stop. He says, watch this. He said, I know you're going through. I know you're going through. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm trying to get us to when, I, when I'm talking about knowing God. Uh, because when you, when you know God authentically, you don't get upset with him when he don't give you what you want. Mm. When, when you know God, when you know God intentionally and, uh, and, and authentically, you, you, don't get, you don't get upset with God when he lets you go through seasons that are uncomfortable and inconvenient. Watch what Peter says. Peter says, in this you rejoice. See, see nobody can say nothing right there. He said, why are you going through? What you going through? In this rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result, watch this, in praise and glory. Peter said the more you go through, the more you ought to be praising him. Peter's saying the harder it is, the harder it is, the more intense your praise ought to be. He said, may it be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He understood what they were enduring. He understood that this is not a, uh, this is not a party. He understood that these are some hard times. But Peter said, in this rejoice, because he knew their problems were causing them to feel some kind of way, even though, watch this, God was at work in their circumstances. And that's what I want to leave somebody with tonight. God is working on your stuff. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but, but God is working on your behalf. God is working behind the scenes for all the stuff you've been praying for and you've been praying about. He working on behind the scenes. He just needs to know if you can trust him in an inconvenient season. Can, can you trust me while you're going through? Can you trust me while you're struggling? Can you trust me while you're being challenged? I, if you... Because if you really love God, God doesn't have to immediately make a thing materialize before you shout about it. If you trust him, you ought to be able to shout about it while you're going through the valley of the shadow of death. Knowing that you're going to come out on the other side unscathed, death will not have even touched you. God said, can, can you shout in an inconvenient season? Can you rejoice in a season that's difficult, in a season that's hard? Can you do that? In this rejoice, in this rejoice, so that your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all that he's done for me, I can't get in a moment and act like he can't do this when I look back over my life and see what he's already done. I'm going to stop because I feel a little tickle in my voice. And I'm going to get some organ music in a minute and we're going to all be in trouble. All right. So we're going to... Have our, have our panelists come tonight. Elder Guy is coming and Elder Owens is coming. We're going to have a little conversation tonight. Got, we got a lot to talk about, but we're going to try to do it in 10 minutes. Something like that. Amen. What? Well, I'm looking to see if there was uh, any questions. I didn't see any as I was coming up here, but I'll take a quick look again. So we'll just jump into a discussion. Yeah. And I'll keep an eye and see if there's any questions that come. So 
Elder Pete, I'll, I'll turn it over to you first. And... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's a lot, a lot, a lot. That next verse, Bishop, last, the verse nine. Mm -hmm. uh, drop that up. Six, seven, eight. Yes. Verse eight. First Peter. Yeah. Chapter one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Verse eight says, "Though you have not seen him." Oh yes, yes. <laughs> you love him. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. And and so that's the that's like the clincher for walking by faith. Yeah. 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 Um, though you have not seen him, then you said you looked back. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, stood out to me when you started off in the beginning, you're talking about the Hebrew compromise. Um, then you went into talking about some things that we church compromise on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Addressing sin. Trying to, I don't know, when you look at the social justice part and how we reach out, like, you know, when I met with you when I came. Right. And I wanted to know what's going to happen. Right, right. Because the church is a community place. Well, the black church, which I love, oh, yeah. love it. Love it. has survived right. through a lot. Yeah. And one of the things that you said, you talked about the image of God. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that came to my mind was white Jesus. Oh, mm. Lord. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And I'm uh, telling you. No, no, I know. I'm going yeah, to yeah. say some things, but yeah. first thing that came to my mind was white yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there is the embedded theology. Of course. Of course it is. There, there it, is. Yeah. it is. So it is. we come to faith with a concept. Yeah. Right. Right. And so therefore certain things we don't address, like you said with the evangelical piece, they won't talk about certain things because they say it's not. But that's based on their otherworldly religion. True. True. Where teaching high in the sky. You yeah. get it on the other side. Yeah. yeah. But, but, we, yeah. but you know, go, let's, yeah. I want to go back to this piece because <laughs> I know I have people watching right now who say, um, well, does it matter? Does it matter that Jesus was not white? Ooh, Jesus. Uh, it does. It does. <laughs> it does. Because to say that does not matter is to say something, you've, you've heard people say, um, I'm colorblind. Yeah. Um, I, don't know how, I don't know how that's supposed to make folk feel better. No. Because to suggest that you're colorblind means that you don't acknowledge me right. for That's who it. I am. That's it. Yep. Yep. You, in, in order to appreciate an individual, you got to first acknowledge them for who they are. You, you got to first acknowledge them for who they are. Right. right. Uh, uh, when you look at when you look at W. James Thomas, you're looking at a black man. Right. A little light, but you, you're looking <laughs> at a black man. That that that's who you're looking at. Yeah. That that and and to and to not acknowledge that right. is to not acknowledge me. That's right. And when we start talking about when you make talk about. This, this image, this, this white Jesus thing, and people arguing, well, it don't matter. It does matter. Right. Because you brought it out. The God in your mind. Yeah. That's what you think it looks God. like. Right. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. And, yeah. That's a, and that's a domination tactic. Okay. Because if, 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 he's, if, if he's, okay, I, I probably shouldn't do this, but, but, but if that's what he looks like, yeah. then everybody that looks like him. Right. Right. Is better than right. everybody that doesn't look like him. Right. Yeah. 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 You, you, you follow yes, what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so that's why it matters. It matters. Yeah. That, that's, why it, that's, that's why it matters. He does, not have, he does not have long 
blonde flowing hair. Revelation say he got hair like lamb wool. That's wool. <laughs> yeah. He got feet. I'm talking Bible, y'all. Yeah. He got feet like 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 polished brass. That don't yeah. sound right. That's right. That sound like some feet with lotion on them. <laughs> <laughs> that sound like right. some, some black feet with yeah, lotion. Exactly. On them. <laughs> but you know, and that's why when you say yeah. that, the concept. Mm -hmm. You said something else too. You um. When you were bringing in how the evangelical people yeah. would say, well, Jesus has nothing to do with social justice. Right. And that's where I was going with it, because the scripture, what he preached, mm -hmm. so that's a way of saying, and I, I keep going back to this because I keep, my mind keeps saying, in the conditioning of black people, Black people were conditioned to take a licking and keep on ticking. And we have. Exactly. And we have. But the difference now is before we only knew what we knew. Of course. But we still knew enough to make it. To sustain us. Right. Yeah. That, that's the thing. Yeah. Because we, 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 we were still, you know, my grandma was still saying, he may not come when you want him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She, didn't, she didn't get that from seminary. Okay. That's right. She she said he a doctor in a sick room. <laughs> she didn't get that from a seminary. Right? Amen. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Amen. He a lawyer in a courtroom. He's she all didn't get all. that from a, from a seminary. Yeah. She got that from her experience. Yes, exactly. Indeed. I may not be able to to read the Bible. Yeah. But I know God. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I know what you're saying because I had that conversation with one of my children because. She follows the guy who put the spit on the man's face a mm -hmm. couple weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. And I said to her, that's not preaching. No, that's I sent that's her right. something. That's and then she said to me, well, I bet, I bet the generation before you would think what you're doing is not. And I said, no, they were better because they couldn't even read. Yeah, and be but they believed. And they wait, were wait, better. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what, did, you, what did you say Peter said? Peter said, uh, no, though see. you have not seen him, yeah, that's right. you love him. Yeah. Amen. And though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So there's some things that I may not, I may not be able to articulate. Mm -hmm. There's some things that I may not be able to talk about with seminary syntax or okay. seminary vernacular. But that don't mean I can't know him. Exactly. That's right. So that's, that's, right. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Because the prior generations built all of this. This building we're in right here. Of course they did. Yeah. And okay. they did it by faith. And by faith. Yeah. They did yeah. it by faith. They didn't do it when they, they didn't have a whole lot of money. Right. But they had a whole lot of faith. A whole lot of faith. Amen. Yeah. So they could see it before they could see it. That's yeah. right. And, 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 that's, and that's something that we also need to think about because I think, you know, now that we've been able to have good jobs, Mm -hmm. we, we've been able to, you know, a lot of folk making six figures. They, 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 don't, they don't live in the hood no more. Right. They, they live in the suburbs, you know. They don't drive cars that you had to push down the hill and jump in, <laughs> and, you know, to make a go. They, they, they got cars that they can sit in the house and cut it on from the phone. <laughs> Amen. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, and I think, and I think uh, that that thing kind of makes, make, makes us a little entitled. It messes with us a little bit. But when I think about, you know, we got folk now who make a whole lot of money and complain about always being broke. And then you got grandmamas who, who clean folk house yeah. and always. put four children through college. Amen. So they, had a, they didn't have a whole lot of stuff, but they had a whole lot of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Now we got a whole lot of stuff and a little bit little of faith. faith. A little bit of faith. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of ties into, we did have a question that came through, and I'm loving the discussion, but you talk about entitlement. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions that came through is, is it wrong to expect God to do what he says he will do in his word? Is that a form of entitlement? The question, the answer to that question is this. What is the basis of your expectation? Yeah. Is, 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 is your expectation based on his promise or your right? Ooh, wow. That, that, that's the difference. Yeah. Am I expecting him to do it because I have a right to expect it? Wow. Or am I expecting him to do it just because he promised? 
So it, be, it depends on the basis yeah. of your expectation. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. That that. I mean, you know, we we got folk thinking that, you know, if I, if I run around church seven times, that he gon' that he gon' heal my house, mm. and that's okay. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. No, ain't nothing wrong with that. I, I've said it a couple of times myself. Ain't nothing wrong with it. But the problem is the basis of the expectation. Yeah. Ne- what's the man's name in the help me? Old Testament. Um, um, come on. Come on. The, the, <laughs> the man who had leprosy. Okay. And and he and he and and he comes to the prophet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I know you're talking and, about. And says, uh, I need to be, you, you need to come out here right. and, and do something and make this leprosy go away. Yeah. Yeah. And the prophet said, oh, sent a yeah. message out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and said, come on, y'all, tell me who the, the man is. And, and said, no, you know that you need to go down to the, the Jordan River I yeah. know you, I can't yeah. and yeah. dip yeah. seven yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you're going to be healed. Yeah. And he gets upset. Yeah. Because he yeah, thinks the prophet ought to come outside, come yeah. say something, lay hands on him, yeah. and then he's well. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's entitlement. That's good. Yeah. That, that, that's enti- you, sometimes, you, sometimes God will do that to you. Right. Sometimes God will humble you by insisting that you do something beneath you in order to qualify you for the blessing. Amen. Mm. Yeah. That's most. Yeah. Because yes. Wow. Growth comes in the valley. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It does. That's that's where yeah. it, that's where it, that's where it happens. And we gotta learn that. We gotta stop. We we got we actually got Christians who believe that um I'm not supposed to have a bad season. <laughs> Come on, y'all. <laughs> I, I, I ain't supposed to have no bad days. Yeah. Why? I'm a Christian. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a king's kid. Mm. Come on, you heard folks say Amen. that before. I ain't supposed to have a bad season. Yeah. But come on, come on. Why are you not supposed to have a bad season? Is it based on your, your spirit of entitlement? Mm. Right. Or is it really based on the fact? Is it based on something else? Yeah. Because when you, when you love God, I got to stop y'all. When, when, you, when you love God, you trust God in the dark. Yes. Amen. Oh, y'all not here. I'm saying you trust him in the dark. Yeah. Je- Lord, help me on right here. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Yeah. And in one breath, he says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And in the next breath, he says, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. You got to learn how to... You, if, you, if, you, if you can't trust him in the dark, you can't trust him. Yeah, that's right. Because you know the saying, a faith that cannot be tested mm. is a faith that cannot be trusted. Okay. Wow. Okay. You, 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 you got you to gotta trust him when it's inconvenient to trust him. Mm-hmm. You got to trust him on the way to the operating room. <laughs> That's some good oh, stuff there. Oh, I ain't there, hear man. what I'm saying. That's good. You, you got to trust him with a bad diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. You, you got to trust him that when you walk out the office and the doctor said you in stage four, you, you, you need to be shouting to the car because Peter said. So y'all, y'all quit reading the Bible. All right. Verse eight. P- P- Peter said, Peter said, though you have not seen him, you love him. Man, you shouldn't have brought that to me right there. <laughs> he, that's what he said. That's Amen. what he said. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Mm. Something Amen. wrong when, when we only shouting when good stuff is going on. Yeah. Yeah. But you show maturity yeah. Yeah. when you can shout with a bad report yep. Yep. On, a, on, a, on a bad day. Oh, we tearing up furniture because we, you know, we didn't got a check in the mail. We we tearing up furniture, and yeah. now and then we go through a bad season. We can't get you to open up your mouth. <laughs> hey man, can't you show up? Something, something wrong. We can't get you to talk. We can't get you to do mm-hmm. nothing. Lord Jesus, I'm out of time. Yeah. We had one last question that came through. And I, All right. Uh, it says, "I get I get the feeling to help others." Mm-hmm but I have only so much to give. 
is it wrong to not give when I feel I can? Is it wrong to not give when I feel I can? can? I cannot. And I feel I well, cannot give. Well, I mean, come on, y'all. Uh, you can't give what you ain't got. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But the one thing you can always give is love, respect, That's right. integrity. Those are things you can always give. Right. I, I may not have money for you. What did, what, 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 what see, Lord Jesus, you there it is. <laughs> what, what, did, what did they say on their way to the temple? Silver and gold, I have not. Right. <laughs> silver and gold, said, I have silver none. Silver and gold, have I none. Yeah. But such as I have, mm. in the name of Jesus, get up from there. <laughs> he said something. Because even answering that question, if I can't give anything material, I can give you some time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, can, I, can, I can give you space. Attention. Attention. Right. Yeah. There you go. So that's giving yourself. That's it. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I was struggling with the name of that general. I wanted to call him Nehemiah, Nicodemus. I was too. Naaman. Naaman. <laughs> Naaman. Boy, see, I got some scholars on my <laughs> team, y'all. I heard y'all, I got general. some <laughs> I got some oh, scholars on my comments. team that know how to Google. I'm trying to tell y'all. <laughs> I was going through all the ends. Nicodemus, Nehemiah. Yeah, what's Naaman. his name? Naaman. 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 That's Naaman. the man I'm talking about. Naaman the general. Naaman the general. That's it. There you go. There you go. Amen. There you go. Awesome. All right, y'all. Let's stop because we'll be here for a minute here. Uh, we're going to finish this conversation up. Um, we ain't going to finish it up. We'll continue it. Uh, next week. I don't know where it's going, y'all, but we just going. We, we just flowing. How the Holy Ghost leads us, this, this is the way we're going. So we, we flowing. We're going to come back. We're going to come back next time. I don't know who's coming. We, Ed Owens may be coming back. He good. I, I like, I like, he got a, he got a, he thinks. I love critical thinkers. He's a critical thinker, so I, I appreciate his perspective always. Thank Elder Guy, who's always uh, been just a he, he brings a whole different nuance uh, to the biblical text because he's not a, he, he don't, he don't, he, he already talk about <laughs> seminary real bad, you know, just, uh, that, that's okay though. That's okay. That's, I appreciate his perspective uh, because it, it does what it does and it blesses the people. So thank you all tonight. Let's, let's pray. And God, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for this opportunity to just share your word with your people. Uh, God, we believe that even in the study of the word, we can, we, can, we can have fun and still be serious about you, God. And so we're thankful for that. Thank you for the time that we have to spend. And thank you for every person, God, who, who jumps on every week just to hear what God will say through us. God, we know that, 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 that the real teacher is the Holy Ghost. We're, we're just the vessels. Uh, we're just the conduits that you use, God to bring your word to your people. And we thank you and we don't take you for granted. Now, God, every time we come together, let it be a blessing to the people. Let somebody be encouraged. Let somebody be transformed. Let somebody be enlightened, God. Let somebody's bowed down head be lifted up. Let somebody who's discouraged, God, be encouraged. Let somebody, God, who feels like everything in their life is going south, but to know, God, that you're not just the God of the mountain, but you're God of the valley. And if at our lowest points, you meet us right there. So God, we thank you for that and we bless you for it. And now, Father, we pray that you'll keep us, cover us, protect us, and bless us as we continue to move forward to do that thing that you've assigned to our hands. We give you praise, give you glory, and we give you honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. and amen. Amen, amen, amen.